Right, 20 minutes past five. Let's have a look through some of this morning's front pages and big headlines. We've got Julia Behan with us, a Young Voices UK contributor. Julia, good morning. Good morning, thanks for having me. It's our pleasure, thanks for being with us. I uh, want to start then, so yes, day two of the of the roadmap, uh, we're, we're on our way out of lockdown. Um, and just interesting to pick up on the Times front page of this, uh, the, the Prime Minister kind of being optimistic, being hopeful, definitely being cautious in the news conference yesterday, saying that we're on track to reopen shops and pubs. But this line's interesting, isn't it, where he, he's telling us to have fun as lockdown restrictions are eased in England. Uh, do you think that is the right tone, that encouragement to have fun? I think it definitely is um, uh, an inspiring tone because it's helpful to see that things are moving in the direction of easing restri- uh, restrictions. And also it's good to see having fun being uh, advised by the uh, government because it shows as well as moving towards easing restrictions, but easing restrictions on non-essential or de facto non-essential activities. Seeing sports facilities such as tennis courts reopen is definitely a a welcome uh, step forward, especially given the impact of uh, lockdown proceeding, uh, lockdown on mental health and the benefits of physical activity. Yeah. What about as well this suggestion, which uh, dominates the front page of the Daily Mail this morning? Um, let me just read some of this. Infections lowest for six months. Uh, not a single COVID death in half of the country on Sunday. 40 MPs demand the return of foreign breaks. Uh, so with seven weeks until Britain truly unlocks, what are we waiting for? So the Daily Mail very much pushing for actually a faster roadmap out of lockdown. Um, and I just wonder, you know, they're, they're kind of stats. This one's quite striking, isn't it? Four NHS regions that cover 29 million people across southern England reported no deaths on Sunday. Do you think it's it's a a, a justifiable argument to make that actually this roadmap should be accelerated? It certainly is a justifiable argument uh, to make. And when um, when you consider easing restrictions or uh, lockdowns, definitely we should be driven by data and not dates. It's great to see... um, that the sustained fall, that the falling cases and the vaccine rates have been going according to plan. But it's important not to forget how we achieved this. It was by following the restrictions that we have so far. So we should be guarded about um, easing things back up, because whilst it definitely is what we should be aiming towards... Yeah, it's really... Int- should- yeah. Sorry, oh, sorry, you just broke up a little bit, Julia. You were saying it should be what we're aiming towards. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I wonder as well then, in terms of the ambition of the roadmap and in terms of, you know, these things that we're seeing then, the kind of encouragement to have fun, uh, the idea of accelerating things, I wonder what compliance with the rules is, is realistically going to be like. Do you, do you think that when it comes to the personal responsibility side of all of this, we're all, we're all happy, we're all standing by to, you know, to, to ease the rules and to, to sort of obey the restrictions as they evolve in the next few weeks? I think naturally there will always be some pushback to rules. You saw an anti-mask protest uh, shop in Tesco's, I believe, uh, just recently. But with the improving weather, it will be hard to comply with restrictions as they were yesterday. But now that we see an easing of restrictions that don't entirely rule out one's social life, I think the government definitely are making concessions that will make it easier to follow restrictions. And the easier it is for us to follow restrictions, the greater compliance we'll see. Yeah, really interesting thought, actually. Um, I mean, it's one of those things, isn't it? I mean, are you making plans? Do you know what I mean? Like, immediately, over the weekend, I found myself suddenly texting people and going, actually, we can meet up, we can hang out outside, we can do things. So I, I suddenly found myself in a world that I haven't experienced for a long, old time, which was making plans that I was looking forward to. Are you, are you finding you're doing that, Julia? Are you kind of, you know, mentally, are you kind of processing this as, great, I actually can do stuff now? Well, yes, but it is somewhat bittersweet. As a university fresher, it feels great that I'm now able to go out and meet up with a friend. However, I was never allowed these friends in the first place. So I'm sure many young people will feel that although we are going to have an improved social life, we can't 
ignore the damage that we have sustained to our social lives. Yeah. Uh, I want to pick up as well on this uh, other element of this this morning that I think is really interesting. So this, uh, so Prime Minister Boris Johnson joining 20, more than 20 world leaders, I should say, in calling for a new global settlement to help the world prepare uh, for future pandemics. Now, I think this is interesting because it involves, among others, President Macron of France and the German Chancellor Angela Merkel, uh, of course, saying, you know, understandably, rightly, that uh, COVID has paced the has posed the biggest challenge since uh, World War Two in terms of, you know, international implications, etc. Um, but also, you know, within that, there are uh, concerns, I suppose, about the, the vaccine rollout. It's been, it's been unequal, frankly, in that the UK has surged ahead and left EU countries behind for various reasons that we don't need to re-prosecute this morning. But it's interesting to consider then that leaders are coming together at this point to suggest, well, actually, we need to, we need to consider the implications of this pan- pandemic for how we all work better together in the future. Uh, with the line um, on uh, pandemics, the pandemic has shown that nobody is safe until everyone is safe. Do you think some sort of international agreement is required? It would, it would, you know, it would certainly cut off the sort of EU-UK vaccine wars that we've experienced in the last couple of weeks, wouldn't it? I definitely think there is some benefit to having an international treaty as the one proposed, and a blended approach to, um, to future health crises and pandemics would definitely be of benefit. However, it is still a theoretical thing. We can only prepare for the previous pandemic that we've had. So it's important that certain questions such as um, accessibility to vaccines and uh, diagnoses are being covered. But theoretical is only good in the theory. We will need to see a practical application. We'll need to see how it's actually... um, implemented in the future mm. before we can really assess the benefit. Yeah, it's interesting as well, I suppose, to consider that this um, this may involve the UK working with the EU uh, as an independent nation uh, post-Brexit. Um, perhaps something like this may have been, uh, you know, more conceivable if the if the UK was still part of the EU, for example. Do you know what I mean? If the, if the UK was still part of the bloc, would a negotiation like this be more straightforward? Uh, who knows? Um, it's particularly in the context of the vaccine wars. Now, I know another uh, story that you want to pick up on this morning is uh, featured on the front page of um, The Guardian as well as the times this morning uh, the guardian says call for urgent inquiry into serial school sexual abuse these are the shocking allegations of sexual misconduct in schools um, and there's calls this morning for investigations by Ofsted as part of an inquiry to establish why complaints by pupils of rape harassment and assault are not taken seriously it's the MP Maria Miller who we heard a little bit from on our program she was speaking to Carol Walker on Times Radio last night uh, Maria Miller oversaw a groundbreaking, a groundbreaking report into the issue in 2016 Um, but uh, fears a disturbing culture has been allowed to take root and of course this throws up all sorts of questions doesn't it Julia this kind of surge of of complaints on this website in the last couple of weeks Um, and particularly around kind of you know keeping pupils keeping school pupils safe at school yes definitely and I think the the thing that really stands out to me is how this certainly is not an isolated incident. Previously, we were seeing reports of uh, sexual misconduct among some of Britain's um, private schools, more elite private schools. Mm. Yet to see that this is occurring in state schools is utterly heartbreaking. Right. Sorry, go and on. Then it, yeah, go on. And then coming down to it, um, there was an incident of a woman who reported... Uh, Sexual uh, sexual misconduct uh, whilst under whilst at Westminster boarding school or whilst at boarding school, and I think what's noticeable is she comments on the school advising her that if she were to go to the police, that she would miss need to miss out on school until an investigation had been conducted. And I think that contributes to this problem of the disconnect between those who face sexual harassment and those who report it. Yeah, indeed. I think yeah, you know, as the as, uh, sort of promises of a of a of a hotline to to report complaints and the police promising to investigate um, those uh, complaints as well. Uh, there's uh, certainly the, the sort of theme in all of this is questions to be answered about why uh, you know pupils feel they can report to an anonymous website and can't you know report or or, or or have action taken in some of their schools and by officials and, and by leaders as well and um, thank you very much, Julia. Thanks for joining us this morning, Julia Behan, their Young Voices UK contributor. Uh, running us through some of the headlines uh, this morning, which is good.